This is Laura London, and you're listening to Speaking of Jung. My guest today is Jungian analyst Lara Newton. Lara Newton is a senior Jungian analyst in private practice in Denver, Colorado. She received a master's degree in English literature before beginning her analytical training at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich. After returning to the United States, she completed a master's in psychology before finishing her Jungian training with the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts in North America. Her thesis for the IRSJA was on the brother-sister relationship. She explored animus development in women who had been deeply affected by their relationships with their brothers. Work on that writing culminated in her book, Brothers and Sisters, Discovering the Psychology of Companionship. Lara is a founding member of the C.G. Jung Institute of Colorado, an independent training society and member of the International Association for Analytical Psychology. She helped to usher in their independent training program and became the first director of training for the organization, a position that she continues to hold. She currently serves as president of the C.G. Jung Society of Colorado, an organization dedicated to bringing lectures and presentations related to Jungian psychology to the general public. Lara's interests include Celtic mythology and Irish literature, and she continues to study Jung's work with alchemy. A focus for her has been the female alchemist Maria Prophetisa. She has studied, taught, and written about fairy tales from all cultures and has presented lectures and workshops on these and other topics, both locally and internationally. Her most recent publication is an article in Spring Journal No. 79, Irish Culture and Depth Psychology, titled Deirdre of the Sorrows. She is currently working on a book of interpretations of fairy tales from a collection that was rediscovered and translated a few years ago, Original Bavarian Folk Tales, a Schoenworth selection. Our talk is being recorded on June 15, 2016, through the magic of Skype. I'd like to start off by asking you about your interest in Jung. Well, it really began... When I was in my early 20s, I had just turned 24, and I was a student, an undergraduate student at that time in um, literature, and a professor who was teaching a, an interdisciplinary course in philosophy and literature turned out to be a Jungian analyst. Uh, her name's Linda Leonard. You've probably heard of her because oh, yes. by now she's written many books. Um And Linda had just come back a year previous to teaching this class. She had just come back from her training in Switzerland. And so she introduced the class telling us all that we would be studying literature and we would be studying philosophy, but we'd really be using a Jungian approach for both. And by the end of that first lecture, I had decided that I wanted to change my direction and become a Jungian analyst. I was a fairly impetuous young woman. So yeah. you actually earned two different master's degrees, one mm-hmm. in literature. And I want to ask you about that because you mentioned that your thesis for that master's was a Jungian interpretation of James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. Could you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, when I decided that I wanted to become an analyst, I was, like I said, I was still an undergraduate, and I started Jung, using a Jungian interpretation of literature from that point on. Mm-hmm. Uh, Linda kind of taught me how to do that, and I continued to use that approach. It really fit with how I had thought of literature anyway. I had a very symbolic approach, which in the 1970s was pretty common in academia. Mm-hmm. Um But then I started working on a small paper on Joyce's portrait, and that small paper really began to become something larger than than it could be in undergraduate school. So I decided at that point that when I 
worked on my master's, I would write a thesis, which was optional in this particular program, and that that thesis would expand these ideas I had been working with. I essentially took very almost mundane uh, themes, images, ideas in the book and examined how those images transformed through the book. Images like water, the bird, woman, um, the earth, and I, I actually had eight of them, and I can't name them all right sure. now, right. <laughs> but I looked at how those uh, energies, are, they were archetypes, how those mm-hmm. archetypal energies related to each other, and in the early part of the novel, you have um, Stephen Dedalus uh, being admired in the mud, having, uh, falling in the the sort of um, almost polluted or at least, at least um, unsavory stream and nearly drowning. And then later, when he has his epiphany moment, you have him at the shore of the water experiencing the transformative nature of water. So you have this, water can drown. This is actually uh, something that Jung specifically says when he's talking about water in one of the collected works. Water is an image that can drown and it can vivify. And so I followed images that way throughout the novel uh, to show how not only was the experience of Stephen Dedalus, his psyche transforming, but also the world around him and his way of relating to the world around him was transforming. Did you choose this book because of James Joyce's relationship with Jung? No. Mm -hmm. I knew nothing of that when I was uh, an early literature student. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Of course, I found out about it later. Yes. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I chose it partly. I was very drawn to Irish literature from an early age, from Mm -hmm. my early teens. And then when I was in college, I one of the early, very seminal courses that I took was a course on three poets, and Yeats was one of them. So I was in this process of becoming more and more connected to Irish literature before I really started connecting that love with a love of Jungian psychology. Mm -hmm. And then a year after you obtained that master's degree, you moved to Switzerland to attend the Jung Institute in Zurich. That's right. So that sounds like a big move. It was a big move, and my intention was probably in all honesty, to never come back to the States. Um, And I came back in nine months. But the move was uh, something I had been working on for five years. And and I'll just tell you bluntly, I didn't have enough money to stay there. Sure, right. (laughs) That was the reason I came back. Um, 1980 was a particularly difficult year for the dollar. And I was intending to live on student loan money, Mm -hmm. uh, which just lasted about eight months out of a 12 month cycle and I realized I wasn't going to be able to to pull that off. Right. So what was that so. process like for you to be accepted into you know by the Jung Institute to attend there? Yeah, it was a very powerful experience for me and I have to say that my experience in Switzerland those 9 months were possibly the most transformative months of my entire mm-hmm. life. And I've had quite a few transformative months, Mm -hmm. but um, that for me, for uh, I think probably any young woman, I was 29 when I left, I turned 30 while I was there. Um, It was a dream or a plan that I had had since I was 24 uh, to actually accomplish this with no help from parents or benefactors or anything. Um, to accomplish being able to go over there, uh, to meet some of the analysts that I had heard some things about from Mm -hmm. my analyst, Linda Leonard, who had trained only about 10 years before I got there, or even less than 10 years, actually. Um, It was a huge accomplishment for me. Um, And I, the process of becoming... Uh, accepted into the program is one of you you start taking classes and then you're interviewed by I don't know how it is now but at that time Mm -hmm. the 
the three analysts did interviews with me. And um, those analysts were uh, John Mattern, Mary Brenner, and Ursula Ulmer. Two of them have passed away now. Um, but these were big analysts at the time. They were people whose names I had heard, and I knew a little bit about them. And to be sitting and meeting with them was a huge event for me. Yeah. Um, they all thought, I have to say, they all thought that I was really young mm -hmm. and mainly really young because I had never done anything. I had only worked as um, a librarian, uh, actually a library assistant, because my degree was in, in literature, not librarian. Okay. I didn't have a librarian's degree. And um, I had worked in bookstores. Those were the kinds of jobs I had had. So I was really one of those people who was coming to the Jung Institute to learn not only everything I could learn about Jung and Jungian psychology, but also to learn how to become a therapist. Um, and this was, that was something that a lot of people did in the um, probably 50s, 60s, and, and 70s, but it was starting to change by 1980. Um, they were wanting more people who already had a little bit of experience as right. a therapist. Right, but you were accepted right away. I, I was accepted, and they told me that they thought, actually John Mattern kind of sat down with me and said, you know, I think that sometime during your training, you'll probably need to go back to the States and do an internship of some sort because what we offer here is really not going to be an, an internship that'll help you. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I clearly had caught the bug. I clearly was someone who uh, was devoted to this way of life. Mm -hmm. And they did see that, luckily. So you stayed there for nine months and kind of ran out of resources and had to come back to the United States. Mm -hmm. And then when you came back, you didn't resume your formal Jungian training right away. You actually entered into a master's program in psychology. Well, yeah, I started the master's program about a year and a half later um, after coming back. When I came back, I actually, this had begun when I was in Zurich. I had started having um, dreams about my child, mm -hmm. and, I, and I wasn't a mother. And my analyst and I, I worked with John Hill when I was in Zurich, mm -hmm. um, and my analyst and I both felt that there was something of a self-calling. And we didn't know for sure if that was a calling to literally have a child or if it was a calling uh, of some other kind of transformation that was going on. And I, I think it was both. Um, but I was, um, now I haven't counted up the months, but I was pregnant within a year after coming back. Um, to the States. And then when I had my son, I started doing some uh, internship, not internship, but volunteer work mm -hmm. um, at a home for adolescent prostitutes. And I was Jungi using Jungian concepts to do workshops with these young girls. Uh, I was using Jean Boland's book on goddesses and every woman. Yeah. I was using some of Linda Leonard's work from... Um, uh, the wounded woman. And uh, so I was allowed to do that in this volunteer work. And I started my graduate program at the same time in that same year when I was on a leave from work uh, and had a baby. You had this really intense Jungian training at the Jung Institute in Zurich, and you yeah. had to leave. And that must have been a bit of culture shock to come back to the United States and and kind of leave that cocoon of that all that Jungian knowledge and yeah kind of be thrown into a program that wasn't essentially Jungian you you completed the master's program in psychology I did and I kind of um I had a really uh helpful major professor mm -hmm. in that program and he knew that I had a Jungian orientation he also he was not Jungian himself mm -hmm. um but he was a family systems guy, and he was very interested in helping me 
uh, make the program my own in some way. Yeah. And one of the things that we did was, um, this was one of my first psychological publications, was that he and I together published a paper that I had written that was on um, my work with adolescent prostitutes and uh, how to use a Jungian approach with developing young women who have had such a traumatic experience. And um, so it was, a, it was a completely Jungian approach to working with a population that Jungians normally wouldn't experience. And I wrote the paper, uh, Mitch Handelsman was my professor's name, and Mitch thought that the paper had a lot of merit. He helped me work and revise it, and we published it in a journal called Adolescence. And then we actually also uh, took it on the road and presented it at some psychological association conferences. Mm -hmm. So that was part of my graduate program. The rest of it really was, you know, learning about testing, learning about uh, how to conduct surveys, um, learning about other approaches to psychology than than what was really my interest. Um, but it was a program that I was able to incorporate some of my own learning and knowledge into. So it was, it worked. Yeah. And you didn't have any of that background when you were in Zurich. So I did not. Are you sort of grateful that you came back to the United States and got all of that experience before you completed your, your formal training to become an analyst? Was that helpful? Um, well, Yes, I think it was helpful. I think grateful would be probably too strong a word okay. because I spent a lot of years uh, grieving having to leave Zurich. Sure. Um, sure. I had, I couldn't tell you the number. It, it seems uh, like over a hundred dreams during those years uh, about being in Zurich. I actually, the first time I applied to the interregional program, I wasn't accepted. And they told me that the reason was, or at least one reason perhaps, mm -hmm. um, was that they felt I really didn't want to be there, oh. that I wanted to be in Zurich yeah. and that I needed to come up with a, something like a real relationship to the interregional society in order for that training to work. Uh, and that was absolutely true. I had fallen in love with Zurich. Yeah. I had, uh, it wasn't just the city. I mean, the city is beautiful, as you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I was there in Zurich at a time that was so, the program was so alive. Mm -hmm. um, I met other Americans. I met people from other countries. Um, it was really what I had been looking for. And I knew that interregional would not be able to provide the same kind of community. Yeah. Uh, and it didn't. But it is true that by the time I got into the interregional program, I was really ready for what it had to offer. So they didn't accept you at first. So right. what transpired between the time that they didn't accept you and they did accept you, what changed? Well, uh, there were a couple of things that changed. One, and uh, interregional was not yet, I actually don't even know what their bylaws say now, but at that time they definitely were not a program that would reject someone because they didn't have a license or have an ability to practice, you know, psycho psychotherapy. Right. But they, as well as most of the programs in the States, uh, and even in Europe by that time, were leaning in that direction. Uh, there's been a definite tightening of the belt of who gets accepted and who doesn't get accepted into Jungian training programs uh, because Jung was very open to accepting people who seem to have a relation to the unconscious, yeah. who seem to have an ability there. And maybe he would suggest to them, as he did with um, Joe Wheelwright, uh, maybe he would suggest that they go back and get another degree, but he was just as likely to say, you're a writer, I'll train you to be an analyst. And that has, that has changed, of course, over um, the hundred years or so that the right. Institute has been around. And I was in kind of in the middle of that change. 
I really wanted to become a Jungian analyst based on my relationship to, uh, well, not relationship to, but my understanding of the psyche that came through my study of literature. And I will say Mm -hmm. that that understanding of the psyche and certainly of the symbolic energies that underlie our lives, that understanding came from my study of literature. Okay. Nothing in my study of mainstream psychology Mm -hmm. has ever matched it. So in terms of my having gotten, I know you didn't ask me this, but in terms of my having gotten a master's degree in literature before studying Jungian psychology, that was absolutely the right call for me. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that because um, I was listening to a lecture that James Hollis gave a couple nights ago, and he has a degree in uh, in literature, and he, I'm sure you, you're familiar with his work. He's yeah. always quoting these really obscure references in his books, and they just fit so well. Right. And I think that um, that his background in literature really adds to his ability to write uh, as as a Jungian analyst. And um, I, I noticed that in your work as well. Well, thank you. Yeah. So you were accepted by in the interregional. And how long were you training with them before you got your diploma in analytical psychology? So I was accepted in the fall of 1986. And I graduated in the spring of 1993. I think that's six and a half years. Mm-hmm. That's something that I like to emphasize to people that don't understand what a Jungian analyst is. Mm-hmm. And if you could just say a little bit about what is required as far as your personal analysis, that is so key here, where clinical psychologists, sorry, I'm not hating on you guys, but I kind of <laughs> am, you don't. They don't require you to be analyzed. They don't require that of them. I don't understand that. How could they not project their stuff onto us? So could you tell us a little bit about those six and a half years? You already had two master's degrees. Mm -hmm. And yet to become an analyst, it required a lot of you. So what went on during those six and a half years? Well, uh, First of all, I'll say that in terms of personal analysis, I uh, before I became an analyst, I had 17 years of personal analysis. Um, and absolutely every one of those years was essential. Um, I went through the depths of the process of coming to a recognition of, certainly not always an understanding of, but at least a recognition of uh, what my complexes were about and what holds me back and what I tend to project on other people. Mm -hmm. I don't see any way that anyone could be a therapist without at least some major work in their own therapy sitting in the client's seat. Um, I know there are some programs that require 30 or 35 hours of therapy. And that's something. I mean, it's better than nothing. Something, right. (laughs) Yeah, certainly the master's degree that I got in in psychology, which was a degree in counseling and psychometrics, which is testing. Okay. That's what my master's degree in psychology was. It required nothing. And they knew that I would become and everyone in that program would become clinicians okay um but yes there are some programs now that require a a modicum of therapy um it's nothing like the analytic and psychoanalytic programs Mm -hmm. and my sense is that even if you're going to do cognitive behavioral work you need to have a lot of therapy. I would say there should never be a program that allows less than 100 hours. Yeah. And of course, Jungian uh, training requires 300 hours of personal analysis. And I don't know anybody who got through training with only 300 hours. Right. Most of us have, you know, 500 to 1,000 hours by the time we actually graduate from training. Uh, let me just say 
a little bit more about the idea of the analytic experience being so central to the training Mm -hmm. um, and then other aspects of what the training itself is about. You know, you mentioned the idea of projection and most of us really don't even recognize how often we're projecting. In any human interaction, I mean, there doesn't have to be a human we can project onto a totally inanimate object, but in any human interaction, projection is part of, and and Jung is very clear about this, it's part of how connection is established. So the first stage of any relationship involves a projection. And if we aren't aware that we're projecting, and certainly the normal person out there doing their job or their uh, being involved in their relationships doesn't necessarily need to know this to the extent that an analyst does. But if we're not aware that we're projecting, then the relationship often uh, is built up on false premises. Uh, what I'm projecting onto you is what I see you as being, and what you're projecting onto me is what you see me as being. People come to analysts in order to be able to understand some things about their own lives that have usually involved quite a bit of projection. Projections they've received starting from their parents projecting onto them, going through life, uh, doing their own share of projecting and being projected onto. And so if the relationship, if the analytic relationship continues that same approach, the analyst projects, even if it's a pretty good projection, the analyst projects the potential onto that person and then helps them recognize some of their potential. But if I'm projecting my mother complex onto you and thinking in terms of what she really needs to work on is her mother complex and she needs to work on it this way, that might be helpful for you. But it's really not about your individuation. If I'm not able to see my own projection, recognize it for what it is, withdraw it to the extent that I can see what's really emerging in you, and then help you find your own path. If I'm producing a whole lot of clients who have paths that are similar to mine, I'm projecting that onto those people. Okay. And it's not helping them find their own individual path. That's what Jungian psychology is all about helping us all find what our path is. So there may be therapists who are really good at what they do, and what they do may have a lot to do with what they're projecting. But that, that therapist is not an analyst because that therapist hasn't worked on that side of themselves enough to be able to help individuals find their own central path. That's what analytic training helps us do. And we have to be willing to submit ourselves to the fire over and over and over again in our own analytic process in order to come out of training and be able to work with people and not project. And, And I actually, let me rephrase that, to be able to work with people and not let the projection be what fuels the work. Because I project and then I withdraw that projection and then eventually a true relationship is formed. And the analytic relationship sometimes is the first true relationship that that individual has ever experienced. Because we're always projecting Mm -hmm. and the analyst knows how to work with that projection so that it doesn't define the relationship. Sorry if I've gone on and on no, about that, I appreciate but it's so that. important to me. Yeah, and that is one of the key differences between going to a therapist and going to a Jungian analyst. Mm-hmm. Right? And in training, you're taught that over and over again. You know, training candidates write papers. They do it with tutors. The tutors help them recognize how they're projecting, even within the paper, on the material that they're working with. We're over and over again throughout the training refining our own psychological relationship to the psyche, which is fairly paradoxical, as Jung often pointed out. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are psyches working on psyches is a paradox. And we have to to learn how to do that totally differently from any other science. 
After you graduated from the IRSJA, you became active on the board of the C.G. Jung Institute of Colorado, Uh which at the time was a local training seminar for the IRSJA, the interregional. Right. And you said that you were instrumental in designing a curriculum and organizing the public programs and scheduling admissions. And so could you tell us a little bit about the Jung Institute in Colorado? Yeah, the Jung Institute started in, um, I think it was 1976, and that was before I was even in Zurich. Uh, it was founded by three analysts who had come to the States from, back to, uh, and, and had uh, found their way to Denver, who had just trained and completed their training in Zurich. Um, and it started as the Jung Center. They offered public education as soon as interregional was founded, which was in 1976 or 77, uh, Denver became one of the local training seminars. Mm -hmm. And so uh, sometime in the 80s, the Jung Center decided to change its name, and they officially changed their name to the Jung Institute of Colorado. But they were still functioning as a local seminar for interregional And that's how I I trained at that local seminar as well as, you know, with the interregional, which was a sort of traveling circus. We interregional still does this. There are two meetings a year that happen anywhere in North America. Yes. And then the rest of your training happens in your local seminar. Um, So the Jung Institute uh, was very engaged in training all of those years. Uh, was probably one of, I don't know that anybody's ever figured this up, but it was probably one of the largest of the local seminars throughout its time of being within a regional. Mm -hmm. And then uh, sometime in uh, maybe 2010 or so, um, we started thinking, we had actually been thinking of this for a number of years, but we started thinking, now we're really ready we've got enough analysts and we're ready to become independent, to become a Colorado-based training program, which had been a dream of a lot of the analysts who who were part of this this group here in Colorado. And so we started a three-year process that IAAP has for becoming an independent training Mm -hmm. society. We began that process and At that time, since about 2004, I had been the coordinator of training with Interregional. So I took on the role of organizing. We had a committee to do this, but I took on the role of organizing what the new program would be. Uh, It was really very similar to what our training had been previously, but there are so many components that you have to add in when you're becoming independent. So I had been uh, instrumental in forming curriculum programs for the Institute uh, from 1990, about 1994 through something like 2009. Uh, And then after that, we started trying to organize this to become an independent program. So you're saying that the C.G. Jung Institute of Colorado is no longer a training seminar for the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts? Right. We're an independent training society with IAEP. You're independent now. Okay. Yeah. Would you say a little bit about how your training here in the United States with Interregional was different from the nine months you spent at the C.G. Jung Institute in Zurich? Well, um, one of the things about the nine months in Switzerland was that I was among a large group of people who were uh, sort of like expats. You know, we were all away from our homes. We had a lot of time, and we were a community. So here in the States, I always had a job while I was in training. Okay. Um, I had other friends who weren't Jungians, who have been my friends for many years. Um, And I had to, you know, do the normal everyday living experiences that anyone in the U.S. does. In Switzerland, I had none of those other outside experiences. Mm -hmm. If I 
uh, went to lunch with a friend. It was a Jungian friend who was also in training. Um, we all talked about our dreams all yeah. the time. We got together and discussed fairy tales. We got together and discussed the classes that we had just attended. Now, I was one of the people who liked attending the classes. A lot of people go to Switzerland, or in those days, would go to Switzerland and would just start reading Jung and would prepare for exams. You didn't really have to attend classes. Uh, but I enjoyed the classes. Mm -hmm. And so I attended classes, uh, met some people who I'm still very close friends with from those nine months, um, got together with people to study, to work on this material. And it was all, all of us were people who were deeply devoted to our own psychological processes as well as devoted to becoming analysts. And it was such a unique experience. Now, within a regional, I was lucky enough to have a couple of friends, more than just a couple, but a couple who have continued to be friends uh, and very close companions um, from those training years. But it's sort of like a couple as opposed to there having been a large group of us in Switzerland. Right. Could I just ask, in Switzerland, yeah. they weren't all Americans, were they? Well, uh, mostly. Really? Uh, there were a lot of Americans there, okay. yeah. Um, I got to be good friends with a woman who was originally from Canada who had been living in Britain for a while. So that was a not, not a U.S. citizen anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there were a few other people from other countries. We, we were divided. Uh, the, the training programs were divided. They still are at the Institute in this way, and I think ESAP does the same thing, that there were the English speaking, which meant everybody who didn't have German as a primary language. Mm -hmm. And then there were the German speaking right. programs. And those were the two main ones. Uh, and then there were classes that were taught in French and Italian in those days, too. But there weren't enough French-speaking or Italian-speaking people to have a separate program. Yeah. So they would be either part of the English-speaking program, and then they would take classes in their own language, or part of the German and take classes in their own language. I see. After you became an analyst, you eventually published your first book, which I'd like you to tell us about. It's called Brothers and Sisters, Discovering the Psychology of Companionship. So how did that book come about? Um, well, as you mentioned in the introduction, um, I had written a thesis on the brother-sister relationship, and my thesis really centered on the development of animus in women who had had strong relationships with brothers. Um, so that was very limited, as theses have to be. And uh, I had a lot of material. In fact, the first version of my thesis was, I think, something like 250 pages. And there's a 100-page limit. So we had to reduce it quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and I had a lot of material that I knew I still wanted to use. And I knew that I wanted to write a book. And in order to write a book, I wanted to write it from... Uh, giving the brother's perspective as well as the sister's perspective. Uh, so I, I began that pretty soon after I graduated. Mm -hmm. And that was in 1993. The book wasn't published until 2007. Um, I think around 95 or so, uh, a little after that probably, there were a series of events in my personal life that put the writing on hold. Mm -hmm. And so I really, I literally put all of the material, this was before computers were as uh, sophisticated as they are now, I put all of my written material in a box under my bed, my side of the bed, mm -hmm. so that every night I slept on it. Yeah. And it was there for 10 years. Wow. I, every once in a while, would take it out and brush the dust off the top of the box and look at it and think, am I going to get back to it at all? Mm -hmm. And then I had an experience in, I think it, it was before Katrina, um, probably 2000, 
four or something like that. My first analyst, Linda Leonard, who has become a very dear friend, um, had spoken with Nancy Cater, who's the um, publisher and editor of Spring Journal Books, and had told her about my brother's sister material. Nancy was coming through Denver, and she wanted to get together with me, and we got together, and she asked me about that material, and I just told her some things about it, and she said, at the end of this conversation, she said, well, let's consider that what you just told me is your book proposal, and that I'm accepting it, mm. so when can you get the manuscript to me? Wow. And that was an inspiration, that was sort of what I needed at that time, and so... I sent the manuscript to her, the first manuscript, the day before the evacuation happened. And Nancy Cater is centered in New Orleans. Okay. So she was evacuating when I sent this to her by email. So she received it. And then she wrote me back a few days later and said, I'm not in New Orleans. It's going to take me a long time to get to this, but I will get to it. So that was the um, sort of beginning of that relationship and and of the publication of the book. You mentioned that um, you had added some things to the book because it was your thesis and you hadn't been in private practice yet. Because I see here that you said that it was also the culmination of many years of observation of the brother sister dynamic in other people's lives. Was that from your clients? Um, yeah, it was a combination of clients and people that I presented to. Mm -hmm. um, I had started presenting on this topic, actually, um, when I was in training, uh, before I passed the propodoidicum. So this would have been in 1988, I believe, was the first time I did a presentation. I did uh, a presentation discussion at a conference that we had and the discussion was on the fairy tale from Grimm's brother and sister mm -hmm. and that was really the first time that I presented on this material that is so important to me that would probably if I had to choose a fairy tale that I would say is my fairy tale brother and sister would be it and uh, it tells the story of a very close relationship between a brother and sister. Um, there's a lot of other stuff that happens, and it all happens to the sister because the brother is uh, in an animal form. He's been transformed and stays in animal form the, almost the whole fairy tale. So it's really – the tale is really from the perspective of the development of the sister. And that story uh, was a story that – I used centrally in my thesis. Um, my uh, relationship with my brother, I have one brother, and, my, and he's two years older than me, and my relationship with him throughout my childhood was really the central relationship in my life. And each analyst that I worked with, I've had four analysts in the course of my, um, in, in those 17 years, mm -hmm. each analyst that I work with, worked with, I more or less had to uh, train them to understand how to look at a brother being the central anonymous figure as opposed to a father complex ah, being more important or right. something like that. So it felt really important to me. And Linda, my first analyst, saw it also as being centrally important that I bring this material out into the world because – for me and for many other women and men, that sibling relationship is seminal. It's a transformative, it's a central complex yes. in that person's life. Even if it's not as centrally as important as it was in mine, it's so important that to leave it out or to somehow lump let's say for a woman to somehow lump the brother into the category of father, mm -hmm. which happens very often yes. in analytic uh, relationships. Um, to do that is to do a disservice to the woman's animus development. Uh, it might not be um, the worst disservice that's done. Sure. There are many other disservices we experience to our development, but uh if you see how 
just even looking at the sibling relationship can bring people alive in a way, bring people into a new relationship to their own psychic development. You recognize that this really needs to be part of the analytic process. Yes. And I just want to say I'm agreeing with you because I too have only one sibling and it's a brother and he's Mm -hmm. a few years older than I am. So I can relate to what you're saying. Oh, good. Good. Yeah. Um, So what would happen for me, uh, I did start um, a small private practice uh, early in my Jungian training. So Mm -hmm. by the time I was done with training, I already did have a private practice, but a lot of what I experienced outside of the practice also, like I would give a presentation, I would be talking about certain kinds of simple, uh, to my mind, sort of simple Mm -hmm. aspects of the relationship with brother and sister. Let's say, take a positive relationship. There's a lot of variation here, but just a positive relationship in which The young woman may, from a very early point in childhood, have an experience of being seen as equal. Now, equality is a difficult word from a psychological perspective, but just thinking in terms of the brother and sister being of the same generation. So we've got a sibling who is giving the the young girl an experience of masculine energy that is not the authority, that is not uh, the ruling figure, but is one with whom she might sort of work out a psychological experience, an emotional experience on almost equal footing. Mm -hmm. Now, siblings, of course, have rivalry, have competition, brothers or sisters might want to lord power over the other. Those kinds of things do happen, but in in many, we could say the majority, but definitely in many relationships between siblings, unless there's a really, really large age difference, which would be something like five or more years, those siblings are going to be in a situation where the parents aren't around and they have to work things out. And when you have uh, opposites, male and female, working things out together from an early age, the animus and the anima develop differently. And that's what you see. And if you talk, or that's what you see in um, dreams, you see it in um, the development once you start working with adult individuals who've had sibling relationships, a lot of what they have come to recognize and can understand as what we would call animus energy, um, a woman's ability to represent herself in the world, to Mm -hmm. uh, believe that she has ideas that are worth hearing. That looks really different for a woman who's had a strong relationship with a brother. Um, If it's been a negative relationship, then there's stuff that she has to work through there. If it's been a positive relationship, you see the immediate effect of it. You ask a question in that book, can we have brother or sister complexes, even though we don't have biological siblings? Mm -hmm. What's your answer to that? Well, the answer, if we see the brother-sister dynamic as archetypal, Mm -hmm. has to be yes. Yeah. Because archetypes and our human relationship to archetypes generate complexes. And then the complexes are the way or the sort of vehicle through which we relate to the archetype. And at a certain point in our lives, the complex, this is complex theory, at a certain point in our lives, the complex can't hold the archetypal energy that it was originally um, structured in order to give us an experience of. And so the complex starts to crack. Because at, then, the, because at the core of every complex is an archetype. It's an archetype, exactly. So it starts to yeah. crack, and then what? And then we have to, well, first of all, that experience that is the complex, it has to be experienced internally mm-hmm. so that we're not just projecting um, the brother energy onto the brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, in most relationships, and the way I follow it in my book, 
uh, is this very simple structure of there's a bond to begin with. That would be like the participation mystique that Mm -hmm. Jung speaks of. Then there's some sort of wound to the relationship. And uh, usually for a close brother and sister, that would be or close or close in antipathy. Um, that uh, break, the wound, would start to happen in adolescence. If it's a close bond, then the way that it's the, that the wound is experienced is typically that one or the other of the siblings uh, falls in love, has a, another kind of, uh, if it's the girl, she has another kind of onimus pull mm-hmm. that takes her away from the union with the brother, breaks that complex a bit and then she will gradually begin to go through whatever other processes she's going through in addition to this uh, establishment of an inner experience of the brother my book does talk about that there are so many different ways it can happen but essentially when an outer bond is broken that's the call that's the call to Uh, what we would call individuation Mm -hmm. and in this particular instance where it's a brother-sister bond the call to individuation is a call to establish an inner connection to what the brother-sister dynamic is about and it's about an experience I'm you know I'm just uh, putting it in very simple terms again it's about an experience of masculine and feminine relating in harmony in balance in uh, mutual respect and mutual uh, authority. Okay. And so you have Jung saying uh, in his introduction to the work with uh, Saul and Luna in uh, the Rosarium uh, collection of plates, this is in his Psychology of the Transference, and I don't have a page reference, but he basically says that the relationship between Saul and Luna gives us the whole experience of the conjunctio. Mm. That's, it's, a, it's a very powerful statement that basically Jung is saying the brother and sister union tells us everything we need to know about how masculine and feminine can relate mm. to each other. Now, there are a lot of other examples of masculine and feminine relating to each other. I don't want to say that brother and sister are the only way, Mm -hmm. but uh, definitely there's something powerful, important, archetypal about that union. And until my book was written, there's now been one other book that's been written um, on brothers and sisters by a Jungian. but until my book was written, there really wasn't much material at all about that uh, particular kind of dynamic between masculine and feminine. Yeah. This is, you know, this is what Jungian psychology is all about. Right. Jung gave us the basics of how to work with archetypal material, and all of us who are Jungians are called to find our own particular ways of doing that work and advance the theories. And so this was one, for me, major contribution of mine to Jungian psychology. Yes, and I appreciate it very much. So thank you for writing that. Thanks. Yeah. And you bring up something that Jung said, which is going to take me to asking you about the conference that's coming up at the end of this month in Alaska. Mm -hmm. It's the first annual Jung Midnight Sun Conference. And you are going to be presenting on Jung's 1943 seminar on solar myths and something I can't pronounce. I'm going to keep it real and not even try. Good. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it either. Okay. And so, but you reference his 1943 Eranos lecture in which he said, I thought this was so interesting. He said, in alchemy, the sun is not the main point. In fact, it's the conjunctio of soul and luna. Mm-hmm. And that's the main point. Yeah. Which is what you just said. That's true. Yeah, it's very true. In uh, alchemy, th- there are, you know, almost as many alchemists as there are, there are ways of looking at what alchemy is. Oh, wow. But, yeah, but uh, one way of incorporating what the sun is about is uh, this idea, Maria talks about it, this idea that uh, the sun is one of the sort of modes of transformation and they are 
if I have them correct, the sun, mercury, sulfur, and salt. And so each of those, uh, in that case, the sun would be considered almost like an element. Each of those elements has its own particular way of transforming. And what we might say about the sun, very simply, is that the sun is transformation through consciousness. Mm -hmm. As Jungians, we think of going into the unconscious as the way to transform. Of course, we have to bring it back up into consciousness. And then what happens when we bring some new information, let's say some new alchemical transformation has occurred and we bring it up into consciousness and then something equally as important happens and that is that this new we could say this new idea this new way of seeing myself this new way of understanding the world or understanding people uh, whatever it is that's new for me I then subject it to consciousness I subject it to my own consciousness and I subject it to the collective, collective consciousness. So let's say I present an idea in a lecture. That's a sort of formalized way to do that. Or I present uh, something I've been thinking about to a friend, to someone, to a colleague whose opinion I value. And then that consciousness, whether it's an audience, a friend, a colleague, that consciousness interacts with my idea okay and it transforms my idea even further mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there may be a very negative interaction there may be someone who says well that doesn't make any sense that might not be helpful or it might be really helpful mm -hmm. um, or there's someone who says yeah I like that idea and what about this too and then my idea becomes another part of another alchemical transformation um, Jung talked about how in, in alchemy, he used alchemy as a, a model for this, um, how we've always got to bring what we've learned, what we've become, what's transforming into the realm of consciousness and let consciousness work on it. And then we take it back inward. So there's always this process that's more or less cyclical going on. Um, what I intend to do, hopefully, at um, the conference of the midnight sun, the conference that happens when there is no night uh, in Alaska, is to talk about the sun from that kind of perspective. Uh, one of the things I've discovered about Alaskans, I've been going up there now for about three or four years, um, working with the little group in Fairbanks. Um, and one thing I've discovered about them that they've been happy to talk about is that they have this almost bipolar way of living. In the summer, they get very little sleep. Mm -hmm. And in the winter, they sleep a lot more. It's very interesting to me that a human uh, body can yeah. adjust to that way of living. But, of course, it fits perfectly. And when the first summer I was up there, I found myself, I was there for about 12 days. And I found myself by the end of the time doing the same thing they were doing. It didn't take long for my body to start uh, being very comfortable living on five to six hours of sleep. Mm -hmm at night and and I've never spent a winter there but I imagine that probably if we would adjust to that kind of living we would have this really powerful solar experience and then this really powerful lunar experience mm -hmm. uh, that would be over the course of a year rather than the way uh, many other people experience it that it's it's a daily uh, kind of um, cycling mm -hmm. So I want to talk to them and see what they have yeah. to say about how the sun, how consciousness affects um, our own experience of the psyche. And I'm, I'm going to use that essay of Jung's, and I'm also going to use uh, his work in Mysterium with Saul. And will you give us the dates and tell us a few more details about the conference? Uh, John Todd and I are doing this together. Um, we're flying up on the 23rd. The conference is on the 24th and 25th of June. the On the 24th, John will be talking about the bat, which I think your last podcast was, uh, you covered some of that. Yes, that's Dr. Work John Todd in episode yes. 18. Yeah. Yes. And then on the 25th, he'll do a talk. I think we're going to be back to back with each other. He'll do a talk on 
uh, the bat as the light bringer, just a little bit more detail and depth about that theme. And then I'll be taking it into an even more light realm, um, talking about uh, the sun's influence on transformation. You have an article that was published um, that I mentioned in the beginning in Spring Journal number 79, Irish Culture and Depth Psychology, titled Deirdre of the Sorrows. Mm -hmm. Would you tell us a little bit about that article? Well, I can tell you that uh, I've I've mentioned to you, Laura, that my uh, that I have a love of Ireland, yes. and I studied Irish literature from a very uh, early point in my own academic career. And uh, Deirdre, her story is one of the high myths in Ireland. It's one of the, it, it, the category is the sorrows of storytelling, and Deirdre's one of those stories. And her story is really a, a tragic love story. Um, when I work with the, the story, uh, one of the things I work with is this aspect of the feminine dimension of our psyches that I see her as representing. Mm -hmm. Uh, she's pure. She's beautiful. She's as soon as she's born, she's taken into a high, remote region because she's. Been, it's been prophesied that she'll be the most beautiful woman in Ireland, and the current king, who of course is going to be a very old man by the time she becomes a young woman, mm -hmm. has decided that he wants to have her for himself. So he takes her, has her uh, fostered by two elderly people and in this remote region where she's never she never encounters anyone the first human other than the king and her foster parents that she ever sees is a young man who she falls in love with he falls in love with her and the two of them with his two brothers go into hiding because they know that the king will be after them and so Deirdre's story is the story of wandering uh, being with her love, but always being under threat of being found. And then in the end of the story, uh, all three brothers are killed uh, by a plot that the king has devised. Mm -hmm. And Deirdre kills herself. She dies of grief. There are a couple of different versions of the ending. Uh, the version that seems to be the most ancient is that um, she actually lives with him because he forces her to live with him for a year and he torments her emotionally during that whole year and at the end of the year he takes her out in a care uh, um, a ride um, and they're in a sort of um, carriage and she jumps out of the carriage and dashes her head hits her head on My the rocks. God. That's how she kills herself. What? Why? I'm sorry. Why? She has no other way to kill herself. Why, are, why is this? So, why would you want to write about something so horrifying? Well, it is. it definitely is a tragic story. And uh, her life has essentially ended when, when her true love has died. Um, and who was her I, true love? Um, yeah, he is one of the sons of Usley. I don't know how to pronounce any okay. of these names. Okay, so she um, has a true love and he yes, dies and, yes. and she can't bear it and she kills herself. Right. And she, you're looking for yeah. the psychological necessity of the experience? So, well, so the experience here, I mean, there are lots of ways to look at it, of course. But um, this is an experience that the feminine principle goes through when there there are a couple of things about Deirdre that are very important. Mm -hmm. One is that she, in spite of the fact that she's raised in isolation and that she uh, is told from a very early age that she's intended for the king, she has a kind of mind of her own. Um, and she has a relationship to something that I would call the unconscious, the process mm -hmm. of life that goes beyond the schemes of the king. Uh, 
Yeah. And there's a scene early in her in her um, when just before she's become sort of of marriageable age, you know, just before she becomes a woman, Mm -hmm. uh, she has this experience. She's watching her foster father uh, kill an animal for their dinner. And she sees and and it's snowing. So she sees the white snow. She sees the red blood Mm -hmm. and she sees um, the black and I can't tell you what the black is from. It must be from the animal. Um, but she sees these three colors. This is a fairy tale theme that happens in some other stories, too, that that someone sees the combination of red, black, and white. Those are the three colors in alchemy. Yes. And she sees them, and she says, I only will marry a man who has skin the color of the snow, who has eyes as black as ebony, and who has the red in his lips, the red of blood. And so the person that she meets shortly after that, when she tells her foster mother of this, um, is the man that she falls in love with. So then after uh, that has happened, we also have experiences. That's the first experience of her having a sort of prophetic uh wisdom I see we could say um after that there are other experiences that occur in which she tells the brothers what she knows is going to happen and they don't believe her usually um but she has a sort of prophetic connection to uh we could say she has an understanding of fate. We could say she has an understanding or a connection to the unconscious. This is a quality uh, that is present in uh, what we call feminine psychology. Tony Wolf wrote about it, the medial aspect of the feminine. Mm-hmm. Deirdre definitely has that, but it's not valued. It is valued to a certain extent by the three brothers who protect her, care for her. Um, the one who she loves, and again, I told you, I don't, the sons of Usley, I, I don't really know how to pronounce sure. their names very well, but the one who she loves is named Nishi, and the two other brothers are Anli and Arden, and Nishi is the one who of course, she tells most of her prophecies to. Mm-hmm. And in the very uh, end of the story, before, when we know that uh, they're going to be killed, um, he's sitting and playing chess with her, waiting for uh, the inevitable attack to happen. And he knows. He knows that what she has predicted is coming to pass. Mm-hmm. And the two of them are able to have some sort of... Um, uh, it's sort of like forgiveness Yeah, that uh, he knows that their doom is on them and the two of them just very quietly play a game of chess together knowing that this is probably their, these will be their last hours. There's something about this connection between masculine and feminine, which is perfect in the unconscious uh, it may not be something that we can experience or experience for long in our conscious lives, but this sort of perfect union in which the purest of the feminine and the purest of the masculine, Nishi is considered to be the warrior with the most potential okay. in Ulster, and she is the most beautiful female ever to have been born okay. in Ireland. So for the two of them to come together is fated. For the two of them to have such a strong devotion to each other uh, is something that I think uh, this is an energy that all humans can partake of. We can see this potential for living in relationship, not only to others, but to the other within ourselves with whom we may be in conflict from times to time. Uh, We can see that living in harmony as a true potential. And we can recognize that that connection 
is fated to end. It's not going to be what we live in forever. We cannot live in relationship, pure, harmonious relationship to the self, for example, uh, for any long period of time. Mm. It's not in our human experience. Yeah. We suffer. Beautiful unions end. How can we live with that? One of my ways of living with that is going back to classic experiences. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've identified with Hamlet (laughs) and all the way through the story, identifying all the way to the bitter end and knowing that that potential and here the potential of the feminine that knows and recognizes that her knowing can't save her love. It's a powerful experience, and it, and it goes beyond human romantic relationships. It's mm-hmm. it's uh, kind of like how life moves. Yeah. And lastly, I'd like to mention the blog piece that you wrote, your thoughts on the axiom of Maria. Okay. Uh, Jung used the axiom of Maria as a metaphor for the the whole process of individuation, and it's a precept in alchemy, right? Right. That one becomes two, two becomes three, and out of the third comes the one as the fourth. So would you say a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well, I love Maria Prophetisa. She's um, considered by Zosimos, who was also an alchemist that Jung wrote a lot about, uh, to be uh, more or less the mother of alchemy. And uh, she had these experiences. She never wrote anything. She's sort of like a Socrates, and he was her Plato. Um, She never wrote anything, but Zosimos writes about what she said. And that's where we get the most of, that's our main source of information about her. Mm -hmm. Uh, She apparently had these experiences that were sort of experiences of going into a reverie and then uh, coming forth with a statement. And so the axiom, we call it the axiom of Maria, is one of those statements that she said in a sort of coming out of a sort of trance. Um, And to her mind, this was what alchemy is all about. And since Jung says that alchemy is what psychological transformation is all about, uh, I think the axiom is really central. So The way I worked with it in the blog that I wrote uh, and the way I think of it is uh, just thinking in terms of a simple human development that the one would be myself as an adult ego Mm -hmm. uh, who sees myself as being more or less intact. I can name the things that I believe in. I can name the things that I do and that I've accomplished. I can more or less name who I am, but that's really all consciousness. And then there comes this experience, which we all have, that as Jung would call it, uh, we discover that we are not the master in our own home. And Mm -hmm. what that means is the ego discovers that there's some thing going on in the unconscious usually it's an encounter with the shadow Mm -hmm. um and so that encounter uh let's say something that i blurt out in a moment when it wasn't appropriate to blurt it out uh something that i start to experience uh anger when i think of myself as a very peace seeking person Uh, I blurt something out that's cruel when I think of myself as a very kind person. Those are pretty um, simple experiences that we've all had. Um, Maybe I think of myself as a very uh, critical, biting person, and I want to be that way. And then I find myself turning into mush. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I find myself feeling overly sentimental, and I don't like that. Um, these experiences are the one becoming two, okay. where consciousness recognizes that there's an unconscious. Ah. And if we then let that develop, we let that relationship actually exist rather than uh, overly identifying with one side or the other. Um, the, to overly identify with what was consciousness before it became aware of the unconscious would be regressive restoration of the persona it would be to go back to the old way that I once identified with and to say that happened Mm -hmm. but um, 
you know, uh, like Scrooge says in uh, A Christmas Carol, that was just a bad piece of beef that I ate. <laughs> That's not really me. That didn't really happen. I'm, yeah. I am who I am. Uh, or the person can become identified with that new shadow material and sort of flip-flop. Uh, someone who was once kind now becomes cruel. It's um, the Jekyll Hyde kind of syndrome. We become polarized in the opposite direction. But if we can hold the tension, if we can let those two aspects of ourselves exist and we can be in relation to them and allow for a new energy to emerge, that's when two becomes three. And uh, Jung talks about the experience of the divine child. That's, a, that's an imaginal way of talking about the third thing that emerges out of the union of the two. And, that, um, and that's, I just would like to add, that's yeah. not an easy thing to do. It's a very difficult thing to do, even in simple situations. Um, and those simple situations are what start to show themselves to us first mm -hmm, right. you know we say I never want to be this way and then we find ourselves being this way and so we have to sort of come to terms with it and how do we come to terms with that and if we allow a third thing to emerge if we allow a new way of being to emerge then we're starting to develop an actual relationship to the self that axis that was once submerged in the mire of all of our complexes starts to become a little more of a clear path. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth, the three becoming four, is something that I think of as a very rare experience. It's even rarer for the experience to be conscious. Okay. But I think rare as it is, probably all of us have had experiences in which without seeking it, we felt like the world has all come together. Yeah. I have an experience of everything becomes clear. We want to be able to hold on to those experiences, but rarely are we able to hold on to it. But those experiences are the experience of the three becoming four. Because out of the fourth is the one, and it's a feeling of oneness. And if we can be in conscious relationship to that, then that's the beginning of the actual relationship to our own individuation. Mm -hmm. So that's how I um, work with that idea of the axiom. It's, it's an incredibly useful, <laughs> I hate to use that word because it's so profound too, but it's an incredibly useful little axiom that kind of tells us almost all we need to know about how individuation works. That's wonderful. And that paper, that blog post is on your website, and I will provide a link to that on speakingofjung.com. Thanks. So I'd like to thank you, Lara, for the generous gift of your time today. Please visit the website speakingofjung.com for more information about Lara, as well as links to everything that was mentioned here today. There you'll also find all of the previous episodes of this podcast, which are available to listen to or to download for free. This podcast is also available on iTunes, Stitcher, and now on Google Play Music. With special thanks to Peter Stuart Lackanen, this is Laura London, and you've been listening to Speaking of Jung.